being recorded. All right, so like I said, we're gonna be talking about different cardiac concepts. Um, specifically, we're gonna be focusing on STEMI. Um, throughout this presentation, uh, we're gonna talk about the different types of, a cor of acute coronary syndrome. Um, to, I want you to be able to identify different patterns of ischemia on a 12 lead EKG. Um, and then we're gonna talk about just common ICU cardiac emergencies that happen. So, First, we're gonna start really basic here and just review what acute coronary syndrome is. Um, it encompasses all the things that you see below. So it encompasses stable, unstable angina, non-STEMI and STEMI. Um, the differences between stable and unstable angina is I just wanna review this really fast. So stable angina is predictable, right? It happens when we exert yourself or you're under a lot of stress. Um, it doesn't typically change in the frequency or doesn't really get worse over time. Um, this is when you sit down and it goes away and it doesn't really come back. Unstable angina is chest pain that occurs at rest or with exertion. It can get worse and it changes in frequency. Um, unstable angina means that the arteries in the heart have met a critical level um, of re reducing that blood circulation. This is why we tell our patients that they have to go to the hospital if they sit down, take a nitro, and they still have unrelieved chest pain, they have to go. Non-STEMI is a cardiac emergency. It's a blockage in your artery, but it's not seen. It's not visibly seen on an EKG. So what STEMI means, it's just ST, elevation myocardial infarction. So we all know that we have the QRST complex in the EKG, right? So that ST segment on that EKG is elevated. So ST elevation myocardial infarction. Um, signs and symptoms of acute coronary syndrome, you know, they're those typical symptoms that we see frequent, the chest, jaw, back pain. Um, they have that elephant sitting on their chest. Um, epigastric pain, so get that shoulder uh, discomfort. You'll have diaphoresis, dizziness, and then those signs and symptoms of shock. So unstable hemodynamics. Um, they'll get that gray, cardiac, I'm gonna die look on them. Um, and once you've seen that gray, that gray skin color, you will never forget it. It is a cardiac sign. So cardiac ischemia um, is caused by non-STEMI and STEMIs. Um, cardiac ischemia, ischemia is just basically dying heart muscle, right? Um, we see this through an EKG, so you can actually see the ST elevation. And basically what an EKG is showing you, it's showing you the electrical impulses through the heart, right? So if we think about it in this, if you have a dying muscle, if you have dying tissue, and that electrical current can't go through that dying tissue, you're gonna have a delay in it, right? So that's where they get that big, huge, um, long prolongated um, elevation in some of the leads when we have a STEMI. Another indicator of cardiac ischemia um, is our troponin levels. And we know troponins because we do them on all of our cardiac patients. Um, the best indicator of the, of the amount of tissue damage is your troponin. So the higher the levels means the more ischemia that's occurred. Um, I, for many years, uh, my background is medical ICU. I worked the last um, six years in a medical ICU that was specific to coronary, to heart. So um, we got a lot of cardiogenic shock patients, post, um, post um, intervention patients. So we really relied on our troponin levels to see how bad the ischemic event was. So, well, I guess, so we have like this little thing in the unit that where I used to work that we would have this board of um, most craziest lab values that we've ever seen. Um, and before I left, the troponin that came in was like 1,200. Um, it was on a gentleman that came in, he had a huge, um, left anterior descending occlusion, um, lots and lots of 
cardiac ischemia, dead muscle. Um, he ended up not surviving, but he, when he came to the unit, he was alive, so we were allowed to put him on the board. So that's the highest troponin I've ever seen. You can try to think back and see what the highest troponin you've ever seen is. So a STEMI, let's, let's talk, talk about STEMIs. Um, ST elevation myocardial infarction, we know that this is an emergency because the electrical impulses are struggling to get through the heart wall, right? So um, in order for it to be a true STEMI, you need to have elevation and two leads with reciprocal changes. And what I mean by reciprocal changes is it needs to, it needs to have depression on the other side. So if you think of an EKG kind of like a mirror, right, we're seeing through the heart, whatever happens on one side of the heart, the opposite needs to be happening on the other. So um, when we look at an EKG, we can identify the area of the heart that the ischemia is happening by what leads it's in. So for an inferior infarct, you're gonna see elevation um, in leads two, three, and AVF. Um, hold on one second. I don't know what that is. Annie, I don't know what that means that you wanna annotate the, the presentation. That's okay, I just wanna make sure. Um, so right here for an inferior infarct, you will see um, elevation in leads two, three, and AVF. An anterior infarct, you're gonna have elevations in V1 through V4. A lateral infarct, you'll have elevations in one, AVL, V5, and V6. And you can have a septal infarct, that's in V1 and V2. Um, septal infarcts usually don't come into the emergency room complaining of chest pain and they come and they find that you have a septal infarct. That's not usually the case. Septal infarcts are usually like super quiet. They don't cause you know, that much pain or anything. It's usually found on a pre-op exam. Um, one second. So let's talk about inferior first. So an inferior STEMI is gonna be seen on with elevation in leads two, three, and AVF. So if we think about the inferior of the heart, right? The inferior means that there's usually RCA invo involvement. Um, the RCA feeds fresh oxygenated blood to your SA and your AV node. And if we remember back to nursing school, we know that our SA and, I, and our AV nodes um, are the pacemaker of the heart, right? So if they're not firing for the heart to function, we're gonna see lots of bradycardia happening. So our patients are gonna come in, their heart rates are gonna be slow. They're gonna be in second degree type one block usually, um, nausea and vomiting, lots of nausea and vomiting, risk of mitral regurg and papillary muscle rupture. I'm gonna talk about this more in a second, but I wanna really focus on inferior infarcts we should not be giving nitro to. So if, let's just think about this really fast. So if we have an infarct on the right side of our heart, right? Those are preload dependent. They need that preload. So if we're giving nitro, nitro decreases preload. So we were actually doing a disservice to our patients by giving them nitro with an inferior infarct. Um, it's really important to make sure that you know where the infarct is on the EKG. So knowing, oh, I have elevation in two, three and AVF, I'm gonna to talk to the doctor and make sure that they, they want me to really give this nitro or not. Um, papillary muscle ruptures is a common um, um, thing that you might see after. It's not really that common, actually. I've seen it one time. Um, there was a lady that came in. She had a huge RCA infarct, um, came back, was doing good, and then all of a sudden, we lost. She became hemodynamically unstable. Looked like garbage. All the signs and symptoms of, cardiac, of cardiogenic shock. 
brought her back to the cath lab. We thought that she was reocluding. Come to find out she had a papillary muscle rupture. This is a surgical emergency if you can make it to the OR. Fortunately for this woman that I was taking care of, um, her son was the perfusionist on the open heart team. So they got um, the OR surgeon was in house already. They rushed her to the OR um, and did a repair. And she is actually still alive today. That was probably about five years ago. So um, it is a very, very um, risky procedure, very high mortality with this if it happens to your patients. Just know that RCA um, it is definitely something that can happen. So on an inferior um, EKG, we're going to see elevation in that 2, 3, and AVF. So if you see right here, and I'm sorry, this picture is not that great. So this is lead 2, this is lead 3, and this is AVF. Um, you see this big, huge elevation, right? That's how you know that your patient is having a STEMI. They have elevation. So to be a true STEMI, they have to have elevation in at least two leads. So in this EKG, we have, we have elevation in three of those leads, right? And then we also have to have reciprocal changes or depression somewhere else on the EKG. And you see right here, we have depression in ABL, we have depression in V2, and we have just a little bit of depression in V3. So we know that this is a true inferior STEMI. All right, let's talk about anterior STEMIs. So on an anterior STEMI, you're going to see that elevation in leads V1 through V4. Um, the anterior feeds the LAD, or the left anterior descending artery. Um, this is the big one, right? If we think about where our left anterior descending is, it's the left side of our heart. And what's the sole purpose of the left side of our heart? It's a pump, right? So if we cut off oxygen supply from that, our heart's not going to be pumping very well, is it? Um, they have also called this, called this the widow maker because um, back in the day, a long time ago, if you had an LAD occlusion, you um, that was it. There was no that was it. Um, it is very common for patients with LAD to come back from the cath lab and have a little bit of ventricular dysrhythmias. A little bit of a couple runs of pack. Um, it's still okay for them to have um, a little bit of chest pain. You'll see tachycardia with these patients, um, flash pulmonary edema. If your left side of your heart's not pumping, everything's going to back up, right? So um, they'll get flash pulmonary edema. And then these are the patients that are the cardiogenic shock patients. Um, so let's talk really fast about why I said it's okay for these patients to have a little bit of. Um, ventricular dysrhythmias or some a little couple runs of VTAC and some chest pain. So there's something um, I like to refer to, you know how like when you sit and you cross your legs and your foot goes to sleep and then you uncross your legs and your leg gets all tingly and it's numb and it hurts. The same thing happens in your heart, right? So we cut off blood supply, we go in, we open, open up that artery back again, your heart is still irritable. It is completely okay for that heart to be irritable, irritable and that's what's happening. Um, now, it is not okay to have continuous runs of VTAC or um, crushing chest pain that they came in with. That's not okay. But usually these patients do have some discomfort when they return. Um, the, you'll hear the doctors call that reperfusion pain. That's usually what they refer that to, reperfusion. So on an EKG, an anterior STEMI, we're going to have elevation in V1 through V4. And you can definitely see some elevation in this EKG. So we have elevation in V1. See that? Goes up. V2 and V3. Um, this is a very big peak T wave. I wouldn't really call that elevation so much because it, does, it starts down here below the base. Do you see that? This is the baseline right here. And your F segment is starting right here. But it is peaked. It's a lot peaked. Um, 
And then we have depression on the other side, right? So you see the depression down here. So we have our reciprocal changes. So you have elevation in two leads, and then you have your reciprocal changes down here. A lateral STEMI will be um, on an EKG. You'll see this in lead one, AVL, V5, and V6. So it's just very, very unusual to have a lateral STEMI standalone. Usually lateral STEMIs are a result of um, like, a, like a diagonal branch coming off one of the main arteries or like your OM or something like that that wraps around the heart. Um, it is very, very uncommon to have a standalone lateral STEMI. Um, and let me show you what I mean by that. So you see right here, we have elevation and lead one, right? And then we have elevation in AVL. So we know that if we have elevation in one AVL, V5, we do have elevation in V5, and not a whole lot of elevation in V6. Do you see that um, we have reciprocals right here in two, or in three, V1? This is actually a, um, an LAD occlusion. There's elevation in V5 here. So we know that this is like a wraparound um, branch. So this one's actually the first diagonal branch of the LAD that has occluded. Um, I'm going to challenge you guys to look at every single EKG that your patients come in with. The more that you practice with them, the more that you look at them, the better you'll get at reading them. So we all know that the standard treatment for um, um, STEMIs, non-STEMIs is MONA, morphine, oxygen, nitrate, and aspirin, right? Um, gold standard is to send our patients to a cath lab. They need that percutaneous catheterization. Um, door to balloon goal is less than 90 minutes. Um, I am very proud to say that all of our hospitals in the South Atlantic Division that um, do interventional cardiology are way below this 90 minute mark, which is fantastic. And then if you happen to go to a facility that doesn't do interventional cardiology, um, they're still doing fibrolytics. Usually the gold standard is, is that they will transport you immediately to a hospital that can put a stent in. So uh, like I said, gold standard is cardiac catheterization. If they get in there and they see that there's lots of vessels that have occluded, uh, usually they'll just refer for open heart surgery to repair that. Nursing management, it's really site management. If you were doing more and more of the radial sites, um, which are my favorite to take care of, so the easiest, the patients can get up, walk around, they don't have to lay flat, it's fantastic. Um, but then we still occasionally go to the growing site there. Um, we're gonna monitor our patient for dysrhythmias. Again, it's okay to have a couple of beats of run of VTAC or um, reperfusion. If you ever question whether it's reperfusion or something's going on, call your physician. Be in constant contact with the physician is best practice so they know what's going on. Um, these patients, when they come back from the cath lab, are always at risk for stent thrombosis for reocclusion of that vessel. Um, they go in there and they're kind of rotorooting around, right? And they're messing with all this plaque and disturbing it. And um, a piece of that plaque can break off later on and reocclude that brand new stent. Um, it is very, very important that we teach our patients about taking their um, antiplatelet medication when they leave, because if they don't, they'll wind right back up in the emergency room having the same occlusion because all of those, um, our body's natural response is to fight it off, right? So if they don't have the platelet um, medication, it'll just re reocclude. Uh, we want to monitor for retroperitoneal bleeds. Um, you're going to see this with flank pain, hypotension. Our pelvis cavity can hold a lot of blood. So it is super important to make sure that you are monitoring that site. It can happen in a blink of an eye. Um, when you are pulling sheets, we want to make sure that we have atropine at the bedside. 
um, common, very, very common for patients to bear down. They're going to vagal themselves. So it's just important to make sure that we have atropine at the bedside. Let's talk a little bit about the different um, care that we're going to provide for access sites. So groin site, we know that when our patient needs to lay flat, we're going to assess the site for bleeding and hematomas. Um, I am a big fan that if your patient starts to bleed, you hold manual pressure. Manual pressure is best practice for at least 20 minutes. There's lots of devices out there, um, fem stops that we're using now. They're great, but until you get control of that bleeding to ensure that that patient's not bleeding, manual pressure is the best way to go. Uh, we want to make sure that we monitor our patient, especially if they're coughing a lot, sneezing, throwing up, lots of nausea and vomiting um, with ischemic patients. So we want to consistently be monitoring that site to make sure that it's not opening back up again. Um, if it is kind of oozy, we want to kind of make sure that we're outlining where they're oozing from to make sure it's not getting worse. Um, and then again, if you need to apply pressure, there's lots of different ways that you can do that. Radial site, I love taking care of radial bands, um, super easy. If they started to bleed, you just blew it back up again. Um, we, I always left the band on my patient, that way it was there in case I needed it. And then right before discharge, I would take it off and then put like a Band-Aid and stuff on. But it's good practice just to make sure that it's always close by just in case it can happen. We want to make sure that we're monitoring our extremities. You're doing your capillary refill checks, um, your pulse checks. And if you see any um, sensation in skin temperature, color, any issues, you need to report that to the physician immediately. So with all of these cardiac ischemic events, patients are at risk for cardiogenic shock. So when the heart suddenly can't pump enough blood to meet the body's needs, that's when we're in cardiogenic shock. Most commonly we see this after an anterior MI um, or that LAD, right, the lateral, um, the left anterior descending. Um, because if our heart's not pumping enough blood out to meet what our body needs, we're going to get cardiogenic shock. Um, cardiogenic shock patients have up to a 50% mortality. So um, these are the sickest of the sickest patients that come in. You're going to see them. They're going to be tachypenic. They're going to have pulmonary edema. You're going to be able to hear an S3 sound. They're going to be cool, clammy. They're going to have that nasty gray cardiac tinge to them. Um, of course, they're going to be hypotensive. If we think about hemodynamics, what happens in cardiogenic shock, their SVR is going to be elevated, their pulmonary pressures are going to be elevated, they're going to have a decrease in cardiac output. Um, we can always look at a CVP if we have a central line, their CVPs are going to be elevated. I'm a big fan of the EV1000s. It's a great way to um, get your cardiac numbers on a non for non-invasive using the clear site. So if you're ever questionable, questionable about um, your patient's cardiac output and you want to know, um, you can always hook them up to a clear site EV1000. Um, what kind of medications do we use to treat these patients? So we're going to give them diuretics. If our patients are backing up and holding on to all that fluid, we need to get rid of some of their preload, right? So they're going to get some diuretics. Um, their squeeze or their, the squeeze of the heart, the contractility is going to need some help. So we're definitely going to be giving these patients some positive inotropic medications. Um, most commonly, we use dibutamine, uh, milrinone, maybe some dopamine. Um, we're really going to want to manage those arrhythmias and watch for, you know, the deadly arrhythmias, VTAC. Our patient, when their hearts get irritable, they're irritable. They're, those ventricles just they don't know what to do with themselves. Um, and then, of course, if that's none of that's working, we can always put in supportive devices. Um, after patients have a big ischemic event, um, they have something called the cardiac stun. So it's basically after the initial insult, the damage that has done that's been done. 
So once we open back up that coronary artery and we start reperfusing that muscle, some of it is going to regain function. How much? We don't really know. So usually about 48 hours after um, we get a good idea. Patients, we really won't know how much they regain until their three-month checkup when they do a repeat echo. Um, and that's really the doctor's um, decision to send the patient for, you know, if they need um, some other type of treatment or anything like that. But after three months, whatever they don't regain, they will never regain. So for that cardiac stun, um, we're tending to use some supportive devices for that. Um, we use intra-aortic balloon pumps and impellas. Let's talk a little bit about balloon pumps. So balloon pumps temporary, um, it, it improves cardiac function by perfusing the coronary arteries. So it increases coronary perfusion by inflating during diastole. So it inflates the balloon during diastole. And it pushes the blood back through the coronary arteries to the heart muscle. So it's giving the heart muscle fresh oxygenated blood. It deflates right before systole. So it decreases afterload and increases your cardiac output. So our cardiac surgeons actually love balloon pumps because it causes that increased coronary perfusion. Um, we are seeing more and more of impellas being used. Um, an impella is basically a left ventri ventricular assistant device or an LVAD, your heel them car. It's a temporary LVAD. So there's actually this little tiny motor that sits down here in the left ventricle. It spins and sucks up blood and then shoots it out the aorta. So if we think about it, it's doing the whole job of the left ventricle, right? It's creating all of our EF by shooting the blood out. Um, this is a life-saving device. So for those patients that have severe cardiac stun, we really like to leave these in um, for 24 to 48 hours to see how much of that function those patients regain. It's taking the workload off of the heart. This impella device is doing all of the workload for you. Um, for and the patient that doesn't regain a whole lot of their ejection fraction, they really should be transferred to a facility that puts in permanent LVADs. So these, these impellas can stay in a, lot, a while, but um, it doesn't replace a permanent one. They can't live with it. If they need a permanent one, they'll usually be placed on a transplant list. So some other cardiac emergencies that we see in the ICU is SVT. And this is like one of my favorites. It's super fun when it happens. It's like, oh my gosh, this patient's heart rate is 200. Um, it's a super heart fast rate. Um, it's a super fast heart rate. <laughs> um, we all practice with using, first we go to our vasovagal maneuver, bear down, blow through a straw, put cold ice, on their shoulders. Um, I've seen a lot of crazy things used. A uh, doctor once had one of my patients blow a syringe and try to get the stop cost out. Um, that didn't work. We ended up having that patient a denison. And then, of course, if those vasovagal maneuvers don't work, we go to right to a denison. So we all know that when we give a denison, we have our pads on, patient hooked up to the cardiac monitor. Um, the denison is actually like a restart, a kickstart for the heart. So if you've ever given a denison, you know what happens, right? So you have the sudden stop of the heart, and then that takes away your breath and the patient's breath while you're waiting for the heart to restart. And then all of a sudden, it'll restart. Um, I will tell you, out of personal experience, this is one of the worst medications ever to receive. Um, in 2012, I was walking down to blood bank to pick up some blood, and the next thing I know, I am waking up in the emergency room uh, with doctors and nurses surrounding me telling me to bear down. So I look up at the monitor, and my heart rate is like 197, and I'm just tacking away. 
um, after trying to bagel, my, bagel myself out, um, I ended up getting a dentist three times. It was not fun. Um, it takes your breath away. You can't feel your heart beating. You feel like you're going to die. So um, if one thing I can ever suggest is just being there for your patients, letting them know how they're going to feel, hold their hand, tell them, you know, that you're going to feel really, really funny. It's going to be okay. I'm standing right here next to you. Um, it's not a fun experience to go through. Um, and then another cardiac emergency that we see is cardiac tamponade. So this, this is caused by the buildup of excessive fluid. It could be blood, it could be um, infection that accumulates in the pericardial sac. Um, it builds up and then it puts pressure on the heart, right? So the heart can't beat. It's stuck in this like vice almost because there's so much pressure on the heart. Um, you're going to see that Bex triad, JVD, muffled heart sounds, hypotension, um, electrical alternance, and this is one of the first signs of cardiac tamponade. Um, I am going to challenge you to look up electrical alternance after this video. Um, we all know that, uh, that we have QRS complexes in our EKG. Um, those QRS complexes vary in size. So go and look it up, take a look and see what it looks like. It's going to be one of the initial things that you'll see with cardiac tamponade, um, kind of like your warning. And these patients are really at risk for PEA. So why are they at risk for PEA? Um, if we think about it, the heart is being squeezed, right? So it can't pump, but their electrical impulses in their heart are fine. The electrical impulses are flowing, but now we've prevented the heart from pumping. So they're gonna be in PEA. They're gonna have a, they're gonna have a QRS complex, but they're not gonna have a pulse with it. Um, treatment for this is pericardial synthesis. It's usually done in an emergent fashion at the bedside, um, and then, or they can go for a pericardial window so they can have that continuous drain put, put in. Um, does anybody have any questions? I know we reviewed a lot today. I would be happy to share this with you guys. Um, and then again, I will make sure that the recording is put up on that YouTube channel.